to be in Oak Grove, uh, Kentucky, and as well as in Clarksville, Tennessee, all at the same time. Um, kind of dancing around in the border there, <laughs> from state to state. Uh, but God has brought us here, and He has kept us in good health till now. So we must praise Him for that, and we must worship Him for that. Now, for our meditation this morning, if you Turn your Bibles to the book of First Peter, the book of First Peter, chapter one, verse fifteen and sixteen. I'm in the habit of uh, reading from either Amplified or King James. Uh, for those of you that do not have the Bible app on your phones and just use regular Bibles, just follow along. Come follow along. I think it's projected on the screen for you, so you can be a part of uh, our reading this morning. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Be set apart from the world by your godly character and moral courage, because it is written, you shall be holy, set apart. For I am holy. You shall be holy. You have to be holy because I am holy. This is the commandment of our God. It's not a choice. It's not something that you can skip. It's something that he's commanding his church. Be holy because I am holy. Amen. Now we are familiar with God being gracious, merciful, faithful, loving. We heard all those attributes of God because those attributes of God are preached well in this country. But what about the attribute of holiness? He says, I am holy. Therefore, my church, my people must be holy like me. They must share the same attributes that I have. He is actually saying in this scripture that what makes you worthy to be a child of God through Jesus Christ is the attribute of holiness. But what is holiness? How can we define what holiness is? If we need to understand what holiness is, that we must first define what is holiness. How can one achieve holiness, especially at this time and in this age? Well, to understand holiness, we must understand sin. What is sin? Sin simply means it's the breaking of God's commandments, the breaking of God's word disobedience to God's word. This is what causes us to be unholy. When we choose to disobey God's word, that's when sin enters into us. Simple as that. When the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lust, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, these are all commandments of God. And when we uphold those commandments in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, that's when we are found to be holy before God. So to understand holiness, we must understand sin. Once we understand what sin is, then we are able to understand what holiness is. Now, if you read the same scripture carefully, you find that in verse 15, it says, in all your conduct, in the Amplified Version, it says, in all your conduct, in the way you think, in the way you live, in the way you speak, you must be holy. That's what the Amplified Version says. In all your conduct, 
Now, holiness, practicing holiness is, is not something that you do once a week on Sundays. It's not that habit that you wake up on Sunday morning, you put on a suit, you are all holy, you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't cheat, you come to church, you put up a smiling face, and you shake everybody's hand, and, and you, you show them that you're a holy person. Holiness is something that is lifelong. It's something that you practice every day. It's a habit. When you wake up in the morning, you automatically go to the sink, and you pick up your toothbrush and brush your teeth, right? That's a habit. So holiness, obeying God, obeying His commandments, despite of where you are, or whoever you're with, is what holiness is. Is keeping God's commandments hidden in your heart all the time. Amen. No matter what. Amen. No matter how tempting the situation is, no matter how the world stands against you to this doctrine, you keep holiness hidden in your heart. If you have time, this might be your homework, go home and read the book of Psalms 119. The psalmist today says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. I know your laws. I know your commandments. And I have hidden them in my heart. So I know what is right. And I know what is wrong. And through the power of your Holy Spirit. I am able to do what is right. I am able to do what is pleasing before you. Because you are a holy God. And you have called me. You have redeemed me to be holy. Walking in holiness draws you close to God, my brother and sister. It draws you close to God. When you feel like God is far away from you, when you feel like this world is creeping in and filling your head with unclean thoughts, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that draws you closer to Him and sustain you in holiness. This morning, it is the will of God that each one of you seated in this place will seek after His righteousness and will seek after His holiness and will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to live a holy life before God because this is the life that is pleasing to Him. When we look at the translation of, of this word holy, we find it in the Greek translation as hegios. The Old Testament generally is written in the Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek. So we go up and look up the Greek words that they use. And the word that they use for holiness there is hegios. And this has three meanings to it that I have pulled out of and have made it into points so it's easily understood. The first thing that we have to understand is put on your screen on here. Uh, holiness means to be set apart. How many of you want to be set apart? Nobody? Let me see your hands. I'm not seeing it. Guess who is? God, the invisible one that is here this morning, watches us. If I was here giving you somebody left their wallet, by the way, it looks like a wallet. I was giving away three wallets. And it had a hundred dollar bill in it. Who wants it? Everybody's hands would go up. But who wants to be set apart? Can we see those hands? Set apart by God, not by man. He chooses you to be set apart. Apart for Him. You see, when a person is set apart by God, he doesn't want to be like the world anymore. So you can't find that man chasing after the world. Chasing after men, chasing after women, chasing after drugs, chasing after television, chasing after other pleasures of the world. Because this man or this woman is set apart by God, therefore, who is he chasing? 
God. He begins to chase God. If we had 10 people, 20 people, 30 people in Clarksville or in Oak Grove that believes that they are set apart by God, they would be here every Sunday. These pews would be filled because they are set apart by God and therefore their heart is after God and after the things of God. Now, I can't tell you to follow God. Even if I tell you to follow God, you might do the opposite because that's human mentality. You tell a kid to be quiet, what will they do? Will they be quiet? No, so you have to whoop your butt, whoop their butt. Be quiet or I'll whoop you. And then they'll, they're upset, they're angry because you told them what to do. They don't like that. Mm -mm. You see, we're all like that. We are free of spirit, free of will. We want our own decisions, we want our own choices. So God is not going to force you to be holy. He's going to speak it out and he's going to let you make that choice. And this morning, remember the Spirit of God is speaking and he's giving you this choice. Do you want to be set apart? Then you must not run after the world anymore. You must not run after the things of the world. Sometimes, we run after the world and we don't even know it. Because I've, I've, I've learned through the years in ministry that when believers pray, they pray like this. Father, money, I need money. Uh, I need a house. I need a beautiful wife. I need a, uh, I need a, uh, a beautiful wife, a, a, a handsome husband. Can you even discern the difference between believers and unbelievers this morning in their prayer life? They pray the same thing. What worldly people pray? Worldly people pray the same thing. They seek after the same thing. Oh, I wish today, today's the day. I'm going to win that money. I'm going to go and scratch that lottery ticket out there, right there. I'm going to win it. I'm going to win it. You know it is. Oh, Lord, please make me win. Isn't that what we do sometimes? We are not happy, we are not content because we look at our neighbor's house, we look at our neighbor's car, and, and we look at the other people. Sometimes people watch, people in church, they watch the Oscar awards and, and they watch all those beautiful uh, movie stars that appear on television. Oh Lord, if only you would make me like them. If only I had green eyes. If only I had purple eyes. You know, if we are truly set apart by God, if we are really the church that is set apart from God, by God, then we should be chasing after the things of God. We should be asking God, Lord, more of you. More of your love, Lord. More of your power, Lord. More of your word, Lord. More of your glory, Lord. Shouldn't our prayer lives reflect the... Shouldn't it reflect that we are seeking after God? How many of you follow what I'm trying to say? Shouldn't our attendance in church, in Bible studies, reflect that passion? Being set apart by God is holiness. Secondly, look, look at the slide up there. Being different from the world. And the last one, sharing the likeness of the nature of God. The nature of man is to get angry, but the nature of God is to forgive and forget. The nature of God is to love, whereas the nature of man is to hate. How many follow what I'm trying to say? The nature of man 
is to be unfaithful, for the nature of God is to be faithful. The nature of man is to be depressed and sad, but the nature of God is to be in perfect joy and harmony. So being holy is to be set apart. Being holy is to be different from the world. Being holy is to have the likeness of God's nature. This morning, my brother and sister, if you will seek God for his holiness, if you would turn around your passions, and if you turn around your mind, that's what the word repent means, to turn around to change your opinion, to change the affections of your heart. And when you turn around and seek God, God will impart his ways to you. He will give you his likeness. He will give you his nature so you can be a light to this world. Isn't that what we need? How many of you remember mother's love when you were little children? Uh, a mother's sacrificial love. Every time, I don't know about you, how many of you are mama's boys here? Yeah, yeah, mama's boys, yeah. Most likely, everybody will say mama's boy, and they wouldn't say daddy's boys because daddy always spanked you. So mama, why are you a mama's boy? Because of her love. Unconditional love. You felt that love and warmth. So you see, when you come to a church, how do you win souls? It's with that love. That love, that nature of Christ that you are able to possess and love one another. And that's when they are attracted. They see the love of Christ. They see the nature of Christ. They see the attributes of God in you. And they draw close to you. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thessalonians chapter 5 we are looking at verse 22 and verse 23 First Thessalonians chapter 5 reading from verse 22. Abstain from every evil, withdraw and keep away from it. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, that is separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept complete and be found blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice the timing of that last word? Till the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the expectation of God over you? It's to be holy and blameless. You see that? You see that? Till his coming, when Christ returns, he needs to find the church in a state of holiness, in a state of being set apart from the world, different from the world, filled in the nature and attributes of God, free from sin. This is not my words. These are the words of his servants, inspired by the Holy Spirit, having a goal, a vision for the church. They must be blameless. And notice in the last verse that we read, he said, let your spirit, let your soul, and let your body be blameless. In other words, let it be holy. Now, I don't know if, if the slide is pulled up or not, but you see oh, there are three words of there. Spirit, soul, and body. When you look at the word spirit, it does not have a capital S to it. 
It's the smallest. Every time you read the Bible and you find a capital S, God is a referring of it to the Holy Spirit. And that's why he writes it in capital S. Holy Spirit, you'll find it, the S being capitalized. But over here, when you read this word, you see that the Spirit is not capitalized. That means it's referring to a human spirit, our spirit. Now, we don't have time to discuss this, but in short, there are human spirits, there are evil spirits, and then there is Holy Spirit God. How many of you with me so far, all right? Now, we have no time to talk about evil spirits. We have no time to talk about the Holy Spirit. I wish we had time, but I want to talk about the human spirit. It says over here, the human spirit, the soul, and the body. So if the Bible divides man up, let us divide it. We are consistent of three parts. Human spirit, soul, and then your physical body. What you see outside this physical meat of flesh, this is the body. We have no time to talk about the body. But the Bible calls this body as an earthly tent. Can you say that with me? Earthly tent. One more time. Earthly tent. Your body is an earthly tent. Inside this earthly tent is the human soul. And inside the human soul is the human spirit. And so when you die, the human soul and spirit leaves the body and goes up to be with the Lord. That's what Paul writes when he says, when we are absent in this body, we are present with the Lord. That's why when you've been to a funeral and you try to wake someone up who's dead, they won't wake up because that's an empty shell. That's just an empty body, an ugly tent that's ran its course. Do you know you're running your course? You're not a battery that will run forever. This earthly tent will shut down. And your human spirit and your human soul must leave this body. Because the Bible says, for it is appointed to man that he lives once and then dies. And after that, judgment. Now, the reason I speak this to you is because sometimes... People possess this body and think that they're going to live forever. And so they have no time for God. They're always busy. Busy doing what? Making money to do what? To take care of this physical body. A smaller house? No, that's not good enough for this body. I need a bigger house. Two bedroom house? No, five bedroom house for this physical body. Well, is that enough? No, I need this thick carpet for the human body to walk on comfortably. How many follow my friends say, see, most of our thinking, most of our hard working hours goes into taking care of this physical body, this human body. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but sometimes when you're emphasis, you're emphasizing on the human body a lot, you forget about the purpose of why God has put you in this human body. How many following what I'm trying to say? Then, we are not comfortable with carpets. What kind of beds we want? What kind of beds? Double layered, a single, queen, double, water bed. There's water beds out there too. How many of you tried a water bed? Well, praise the Lord. We have some rich folks in here this morning. <laughs> we tried what? You see that? taking care of the body, making money, spending hours. I don't know about you, but women tend to spend a lot of time in the morning getting ready. Men too. Be honest with me, men. Amen? Yeah, men and women. So we spend a lot of time combing our hair, showering. See, we take care of our physical body. And then when your physical body is hungry and tired, you're supposed to rest. You're supposed to eat. You see how, much, how many hours go into taking care of your body. What about the human soul and spirit? 
How much time do you take care of what is inside you? The essence of your being. Your soul, your spirit, your heart. How is your heart? How are you doing emotionally this morning? Are you at peace, brother? Dear sister, are you at peace? Are you filled with joy? Are you content? Are you happy? How much time did you spend this morning taking care of what is inside? I'm blessed to know that all of you made it to church this morning. You know why? Because you are concerned of taking care of what's inside this physical body. Can we hear an amen to that? Because you are invested in taking care of what is inside you. And remember that God is interested too. That's why he says in the Gospel of Matthew, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out from the mouth of God. What does that mean? That means your human soul and spirit does not need physical food to be happy. It needs to hear from God. It needs God's word. I don't know about you, every time I come to church, I may come in sad, but the moment I leave, there's an inexplicable joy in me. I feel full. Every time I pray and read my Bible, I feel the joy of God increasing in me. All of a sudden, the, the troubles of the world don't bother me anymore. What just happened there? God fed my soul. God fed my spirit. Why did he feed my soul and spirit? Because I was willing to take care of my soul and spirit. I was willing to come in this morning and offer my body and offer my soul and offer my spirit for God to fill with his spirit, to fill with his word. And when my human soul and human spirit is filled with God's word and God's spirit, I am joyful. I am not afraid anymore. I am filled and content. Many times we forget that our heart, which is our human soul, wants to find happiness but cannot find happiness in money cannot find happiness in this world because God alone is the one that can satisfy your human soul and your human spirit. My dear brother and sister, I want to encourage you this morning that if you don't read your Bible every day and you don't spend time in God's presence in your house every day, that sadness is going to get worse. That anxiety is going to get worse. That fear is going to get worse. How many follow my friend said? Because the source of all joy and peace is found in God's presence. And if you come here every morning to church, or if you kneel down at home and pray, God will fill your human soul and spirit. He will lift you up. He will strengthen you. He will put his spirit in you. You will be encouraged. In other words, I like to say, I always feel I always feel like I'm on top of the world. I always feel that. Why? Because God has filled my human soul and human spirit. This morning, as we are talking about our human soul and spirit, as I mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, God's word gets put in our human soul and spirit. Our minds begin to grasp God's word. Our hearts begin to love his word. And then the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in our thoughts and in our hearts. Now remember what the Bible said. The Bible said when the Holy Spirit is upon you, he will bring into remembrance those things that I have said. How many of you were heard the voice of the Holy Spirit in you? Anybody? For example, when I'm doing something wrong, it's the Holy Spirit's voice that I hear that says, don't do that. When you want to skip Sunday church, 
You're going to hear a voice. No. Only if you heard it. Yeah, all you have to do is exercise it. Get familiar with that voice. I remember a church member used to call me every day. At first, I couldn't recognize a voice on the telephone. But as she called me every day, within two weeks, I was familiar with her voice. I knew her voice because I recognized it. My heart and my mind got familiar with the voice, so I knew it was Maxine that was calling. So when you familiarize yourself to the voice of God, it becomes easy to hear Him. Sometimes we like to fight with the voice of God. Let's look at the scripture. Genesis, <clears throat> the book of Genesis, chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse 3. Ready? Let's read. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is in the flesh, yet his days shall be numbered a hundred and twenty years. You see that word over there where it says, My spirit shall not Strive. The word strive or they means fight. Remember in the New Testament there's another scripture that says, Grieve not the spirit. Grieve not his voice. Resist not his voice. But give in to what the Holy Spirit says. What is the Holy Spirit telling you this morning? What has he been telling you for the past month? telling you to love your wife in a more better way? Is he telling you to take her out for dinner? You better. Because a storm is coming if you don't. A big storm. <laughs> is he telling you to speak words of love? Is he prompting you to help someone in the church? Is he prompting you to attend Saturday night prayer? Here at the church, Saturday morning, I believe, Saturday morning. What is he prompting you? If only the church would be receptive to his voice. But it is difficult to hear his voice. It is difficult to hear his, his word. Why? Why is it difficult? Let's read this scripture again to find out the answer. First John. 1st John chapter 2 1st John chapter 2 verse 15 and 16 whoever has that portion of scripture open please read First John chapter 2 verse 15 and 16 do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For in all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. Three things amplified and King James Version reads that as the pride of life, the flesh of the eyes, and the, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. Three things, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. These are the three things that will war in your human soul and in your human spirit and will lead you and push you to disobey the voice of the spirit. What is the pride of life? Anybody? The pride of life is the pride that you take in your material possessions, in your physical looks. The lust of the eyes is what you want when you look. When you look at a beautiful woman, when you look at a beautiful house, I want that. How many of you went shopping in the mall? Have you seen those brand new shirts and suits? You're lusting after that shirt. You're lusting after that suit. That's lust of the eyes. 
and the lust of the flesh is the desires of your evil self. That's selfishness, that's uh, pride again comes in there, that's uh, being lazy, being lustful, in all the desires of the human body that the body wants. Gluttony and great interest for food, all this rustles against the Spirit of God. If you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has subjected these three things in your life, brother and sister, then the voice of the Holy Spirit will become more easy to listen to. How many of you with me so far? You have to put to death these lusts and these prides. You have to submit to God's voice and say no to these lusts and pride. Now do you see the struggle? Now do you see the struggle? If you are a man and a woman that gives in to what your pride wants, gives in to what the lust of your eyes want, give in to what the lust of your flesh wants, then we call you a worldly man, a man of the flesh, a fleshy man. But if you are a man or a woman that has conquered these lusts and pride, and you're a person that submits themselves easily to the Holy Spirit, then we call you as a man who is filled in the Spirit, as they call Stephen in the New Testament, a man full of the Holy Spirit. And when you're full of the Holy Spirit, when you're full of God's Word, it's easy to obey God's commandments. It's easy to fulfill the requirements of being holy before God through the power of the Spirit that dwells in you. But you have to start somewhere. You have to start obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit first. Some people like God in, inside. They invite Jesus into their hearts. And let's assume your heart has 10 rooms, but you keep Jesus locked up in one room. And the nine rooms you give preference to your flesh. How many follow what I'm trying to say? That's most of us. We give one room to God and we use the other nine rooms for our fleshy desires and our pride. That's not going to work. That's not how you're going to be holy. You're always going to be engaged in sin. The Bible tells us that. Let's look at the scripture. The next slide says, when you sin, you are enslaved by sin. The Bible even uses the word, the power of sin. That means sin has power to control you. Just like God has power over you, sin has power. It draws you away from God. It draws you away from God and keeps you in the world. Because it has power. So when you give your hand, your right hand to sin, by the time you know it, sin already took hold of your left hand, your right leg, and your left leg, and your whole body. By the time you know it, you're not in church anymore. You're somewhere out there, in a bar. How many follow what I'm trying to say? That's the power of sin. God does not want us to live lives like that. He wants us to surrender to his spirit, surrender to his word, so that he can fill us and fulfill the requirement of holiness and stay in holiness. There are three things I want to mention this morning since we are short of time, so I'll move fast. There are three goals that God will achieve in you through this holiness. The first goal is holiness leads to seeing God. That's what the scripture says. He who is holy shall see God. Secondly, it aligns you with God's heart. So when people see you, when the worldly people see you, they see you that you're a holy person, showing the attributes of love, mercy, holiness, they will look at you and say, something is different. 
something is different. I, I, I feel the love from this person. I feel the care from this person. I feel peace from this person. You see, God is using you now to win those who are hurt and lost. And how can they be attracted to you? They can be attracted to you if you possess the attributes of God. That's why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then again, he mentioned that I will make you a light. My spirit will come and rest on you. And through you, it will win souls. How? Through the attributes of God. Through righteousness. When they see that you are not selfish. When they see that you are not a jealous person. That you are a loving person. You are a caring person. And you do what is right. They are attracted to that, brother and sister. So allow God to make you holy this morning. The last thing I want to say, the third three things that happen is holiness leads to you being beautiful before God. In the scripture, the Bible that says, let's worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. That means the quality and attribute of holiness in the sight of God is beautiful. What do we find beautiful? Perhaps the flowers out there, perhaps uh, the color of your shirt, or, or a nice tie, the brother is wearing. We find, well, that's beautiful to look at. But God, He searches our hearts, He searches our minds and our spirits and souls, and He looks for the quality of holiness. And when He finds the quality of holiness, He says, Look at my beautiful children. They are beautiful just like me. Holiness makes them beautiful before God. Don't you want to be beautiful before God this, this morning? Don't you want to be the light to this world this morning? Don't you want to see God's Spirit rest in you and use you to bring those that are in God? I will close in just five more minutes. Since we have no time, there are three elements that will make us holy. The first element, if you look at it, let's read Romans chapter 5, verse 9. The book of Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, since we have now been justified, declared free of sin, by his blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him, Jesus Christ. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ makes us holy, washes us and makes us holy. That is why we partake in the Lord's communion. We believe that the blood of Jesus washes us from every sin. Let's read uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Jesus carried personally our sins in his body on the cross, willingly offering himself on it, as on an altar of sacrifice, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness, that through his wounds we are healed. Can you see the vision of Jesus Christ here? Why he's dying on the cross? Is to set you free from sin. Is to forgive you of sin and to keep you free from sin. Amen. Sometimes we forget that. We think that we came to the altar, we asked the Lord to cleanse us of our sins and then we go back and sin again. No, my brother and sister, the goal of God is to free you from sin. How many of you want to be free from sin? Let me an amen. Only through his blood. Remember the song, The Blood of Jesus? Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. 
There's many people that I have met in church that are still guilty from their past. They come and talk to me and say, brother, when I was 20 some years ago, I did wrong to a woman and you know, I've never supported her and uh, you know, I did stuff to her and I shouldn't have guilt. Guilt comes from sin. And so God on the cross dwelt with your sin and dwelt with your guilt. So once he forgives you of your sin and you follow the scripture of going and making peace with that person that you did wrong, then that guilt is wiped away too. Amen? That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. And you will know in your human spirit and in your human soul that I'm free because I asked God to forgive me. I went and made peace with that person that I had wronged. And now I feel the guilt is gone. Only the blood of Jesus. It's not in the power of man's word. You cannot buy the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for you, his children. So you could be from free from sin and guilt. Satan loves people who carry guilt. I don't know if you knew that. Satan loves people who carry guilt. He thinks it's, it's playtime for him. Because then he goes and brings past thoughts, failures, and tries to torture them. But God frees us from all sin and guilt. Next, the second element that makes us holy is found in the scripture. Look at uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 17. This word reads, sanctify, meaning make me holy, make them holy through thy truth, Thy word is truth. The word of God is able to tell us what is right and wrong. What is right and wrong in a relationship? What is right and wrong in a church? What is right and wrong with our behaviors? With our attitudes? With what we speak in the pulpit? We judge through God's word. We use the word of God as a basis of judging what is right and wrong. Because this is the word that came from God. So the word of God sanctifies us. The more we read the word, the more we are empowered by the word, meaning we receive knowledge on what God wants us to do and how to do it. And therefore when we do it his way, in a holy way, we are free from sin. Amen? Amen? We are free from sin. And the last one is the third element. Very important element, the Holy Spirit of God. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2 and I'll close. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2. I'm reading from the Amplified, mind you. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. You notice the word of it. Sanctifying work. The Holy Spirit is making you holy. When he is dwelling in you. All the believers of Christ. When they are filled in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now begins to speak. And begins to sanctify you. It gets rid of all that selfishness. Those evil desires. And the evil passions. The evil self. And Colossians talks about. Putting the image of God. The new self. Created after the image of God. You see the work. The work of Jesus' blood, the work of the word of Jesus, and now the work of God's Holy Spirit in us, all performing one task, very important task, sanctifying you. Of course, there's other works. The Holy Spirit comforts you. You know that. He brings you into remembrance. He will speak for you. There's so many other words. But the, this morning, I want to focus on the sanctifying work. To be made holy and presentable before God. To make holy your body. To make holy your soul. And to make holy your human spirit. When? 
Till when, brother? Till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must be holy because our God is holy. Bow your heads down and we say a quick word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us this morning. Thank you for you are in us. You are dwelling in us. You are living in us. And you speak to us every day, Lord, drawing us closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Keep us safe from this world. Give us strength to overcome the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Help us to be submissive to your voice. Help us to be covered in your blood, free from sin and guilt, filled in your word, filled in your spirit, Master. This morning, I will pray, Lord, I pray that you make us strong witnesses to this community. Everyone that is seated over here, let them experience the power of your blood. Let them experience the power of your word and the power of your spirit and let them leave this place as witnesses for you, Lord. Let everyone in this area see Jesus Christ in them. Let them see Jesus Christ in me, Lord. As Paul said, it is not I that live, but it is you, Lord, that lives in me. And that's who I'm living for. Help us to be open vessels this morning submissive to your word, submissive to the work of your spirit in us, that we may be obedient children before your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, and the people said, Amen. 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 Let's uh, give the Lord uh, uh, a hand clap of praise. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Samuel. Um, uh, just before we dismiss,